And don't go messing around with this stuff. That's pure fat right there. You know, one whiff and you're muerto, man. Ooh, so close. Thanks for playing, but that's incorrect. But how did he get it? They smuggled it in from China and cut it in abandoned buildings. All your dad had to do was brush up against some while he was feeding straight cats. Oh for two. Tough look. Gave the kids mouth to mouth. And like that, stop breathing. Just from the residue on their lips. Believe it or not, that one is also false. This video is sponsored by NordPass. Fentanyl, the incredibly potent synthetic opioid, is everywhere. It's in newspapers, it's on cable news, it's being found in all sorts of other drugs, and it's even finding its way into some of the most popular shows on television. The drug is a real problem. In 2022, overdoses involving fentanyl killed over 100,000 Americans, and that number has exploded exponentially since 2014. This is an acceleration of the American opioid epidemic that has ravaged the nation over the past decade. And as is the case with any buzzy news story that even remotely involves Involves the police, broadcast cop shows, ones airing on CBS, Fox, NBC, or ABC, have been quick to insert the drug into their scripts. Fentanyl is a supplier's dream, a fraction of the cost and exponentially more addictive. This is not surprising. Broadcast TV, with its hundreds of episodes, has always looked to news headlines for inspiration, and the production schedule has always enabled shows to be reactive to current events. In some cases, they can even jump on trends before they're even completely real. Uh, I'm trying to see if you have a drug in there called fentanyl. Sure. Synthetic heroin, used as an anesthetic during surgery. Right. And occasionally for joyriding by anesthesiologists, which is why I get audited all the time. That's an episode from 2012, well before fentanyl really entered the public consciousness from a little show called Blue Bloods. Yeah, that's right. We're doing more Blue Bloods content. It's it's the worst cop show. And I, I'm back for more. Can't quit Blue Bloods. It's it's like heroin. It'll ruin your life. I know it's ruined mine. Don't no, sling at I me. I know that at... Charles murdered her. How do you know that? God told me. But just because these shows are talking about fentanyl doesn't mean these portrayals are, let's say, accurate. What's in it? Explosive? No. Drugs. Whoa, 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 wait. Okay, that's fentanyl. Okay, if that back rips, we're all dead. There are a ton of myths about fentanyl out there, and many of these shows are all too happy to spread them. It's, it's everywhere. It's in Advil. It's in marijuana. It's in Halloween candy. Touch it and you'll die. Breathe near it and you'll die. Quick, shield your eyes. Looking at pictures of it online can kill you too. Just like drug dealers are cutting their product with fentanyl to make it more potent and addictive, broadcast TV, and especially cop shows, are cutting their episodes with fentanyl for the same reasons. Did you see what I did there? Welcome to Copaganda, a series of videos exploring the portrayal of the police on television and how that portrayal has shaped our understanding of who the police are and what they should be. We've covered how the LAPD helped start the cop show genre by providing creative input and censorship on Dragnet, before looking at individual shows like Brooklyn Nine-Nine, The Wire, Marvel Superheroes, Spooky Cop Shows, TM, Paw Patrol, and much more. Today, we're gonna be doing something a little different. Instead of looking at a case study, we're doing more of a survey. I looked at 20 22 episodes of currently airing shows that included a fentanyl storyline from one of the major four networks, ABC, Fox, NBC, and worst of all, CBS. That, that, that's where Blue Bloods airs. The vast majority of these shows are cop shows, but there will be two medical dramas and two first responder shows included in the survey, you know, for diversity. You may have never seen any of these shows. You are, after all, on YouTube watching a video essay. You're cool. You're hip. You can't be bothered with season 14 of NCIS LA. I'll have you know that these are among the most watched shows in the country. For example, NCIS, FBI, Chicago Fire, Blue Bloods, and The Equalizer, all shows that I looked at for this video, were the five most watched programs that weren't football in the 2021-22 broadcast season, each topping 9 million viewers on average per episode. Sorry, NCIS LA? You're a fan? Heard of it? Oh, who am I kidding? It's my favorite! <laughs> These shows go out to a ton of viewers, and for many, TV is their main contact point with fentanyl as a thing. So let's see what these shows are telling America about the drug, what they get right, which myths they're perpetuating, and why it all matters. 
So without further ado, let's play Fentanyl, Fact or Fiction? Factinal or fic Fictional? Fic fiction? Fict fictinal? Fic what is fentanyl exactly? Let's start with the basics. It's a good place to start. What is fentanyl and how strong is it? You ever hear of fentanyl? Yeah, fun stuff. A hundred times more potent than morphine. Fentanyl, it's all over the latest commission updates. Record overdoses and it's what, 50 times more potent than heroin? Lab results just came back on a suitcase, found traces of carfentanil, 100 times more toxic than fentanyl, 10,000 times more toxic than morphine. All of these shows that I watched were quick to drop in stats like this, almost like quick little fact sheets for their viewers. Hey, you know that scary drug? Well, this one's even scarier. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine. The slightest exposure can trigger an overdose. What do you say? My partner's gonna wake up, right? Tell me she's gonna wake up! While these numbers are certainly eye-popping, they are completely correct. One milligram of fentanyl is as potent as 50 milligrams of heroin or 100 milligrams of morphine. And carfentanil is 100 times more potent than fentanyl. The math checks out, and it is indeed as horrific as it sounds. So, a good job clearing the absolute bare minimum broadcast cop shows. You're right, fentanyl strong. Enjoy the win, cop shows. It, it, it's not gonna last. Because while these shows are correct that it's very potent, they're not exactly correct about what that potency means. Number two, will you die if you touch it? Oh yeah, you touch the pure stuff without wearing gloves, say goodnight. This is one of the biggest myths about fentanyl. The idea that it is so potent that you can overdose simply by brushing up against it. And it's something we can see all over these cop shows. In this Blue Bloods episode from 2017, Donnie Wahlberg's partner overdoses after picking up a tray that just had fentanyl-laced heroin on it somewhere. She's overdosing. She, what? What are you talking about? The tray she picked up, there was fentanyl on it. We gotta get her to a hospital, now! By the way, why would you ever invite the police into your home for questioning? Especially if you had your entire drug set up, like, out. The, the way I see it, there's only two ways that this situation played out. Either he set up to do heroin, and then was like, oh, you know what, now's a good time to talk to the police. Or he just did it and is like, now's a good time to talk to the police. Just don't invite the police into your house for questioning. Like ever. Don't just don't do it. This is a near textbook example of the idea of contact exposure. And it's not just something that happens on TV shows. Real life cops have been dropping like flies from the same thing. However, in reality, this is uh, just simply not a thing that happens. As explained by Dr. Ryan Marino, Medical Director of Toxicology and Addiction at University Hospitals Cleveland. Fentanyl can be absorbed through the skin, but the word can is doing a lot of work in that sentence. A piano can fall on your head when you cross the street. Your skin is a really good barrier, and fentanyl can only go through under very specific conditions. Namely, it would require massive amounts and very long time. He's also a great follow on Twitter. While fentanyl is incredibly potent, it needs to get into the bloodstream through mucous membrane contact, not just your skin. They actually make these transdermal fentanyl patches designed specifically to administer the drug through contact, but they generally take between 12 to 16 hours to take effect. If you covered both of your palms, which would likely absorb more easily than other skin with fentanyl patches, completely covered, it would still take 14 minutes to even receive a standard dose commonly used for treatment of pain. It's also worth remembering that these patches are not the same low potency dry powder that is encountered on the street. Many of these viral videos of police officers overdosing from contact exposure have been thoroughly debunked. And in most instances, the officers experiencing an overdose are exhibiting symptoms not of overdoses, but of panic attacks. Fentanyl overdoses cause slowing of breathing and heart rate, not the dizziness and rapid breathing often described in these stories. I can tell you with essentially 100% with surety that this was not fentanyl poisoning. When people get fentanyl poisoned, they don't just collapse like that. And not, not moments after an exposure. He says the deputy's reaction was likely caused by stress, not the drug itself. Yet, this myth about contact exposure is all over broadcast television. Lopez's gun dealer says a huge amount of fentanyl moves through the house. Now, what if we get exposed? Uh, incidental contact won't give you an overdose, especially if it's already been cut or pressed into pills. Okay, what if it hasn't been cut yet? Pure fentanyl? Mm -hmm. Two micrograms kills you if inhaled. It's less than half a grain of rice. 
And it's not even just the cop shows. Here's Chicago Med spreading this lie multiple times in the same episode. Now he could have either inhaled it or even just touched it, but it's 100 times stronger than heroin. And that could explain why the Narcan's moving so slow. Actually, no, that would not explain anything because Narcan is specifically designed to treat opioid overdoses. Even absorbed through the skin, fentanyl can cause mental status changes and respiratory distress. Strip. She's right, Caesar. No, she's not right. You should wash your hands, but you're not going to get high off of that. Even a minute amount inhaled or absorbed through the skin can cause an overdose and even death. Why, why would you freak out about fentanyl being in a hospital? There's already fentanyl in hospitals. This is a drug that doctors use. Why would you be freaking out about it being in a hospital? I don't, I don't get it. I'm just kidding. I know why. It's because Dick Wolf makes Chicago mad. These are some of the most vanilla ways I've seen contact exposure portrayed. Sometimes it's way more fun and ridiculous. <laughs> Here's an episode of NCIS where the presence of fentanyl prevents professional medical examiners from doing an autopsy. Evacuate autopsy. What? Get out, get out, get out, get out. Carfentanil, at least six milligrams. Oh, wow. Emergency showers, go. Oh, no, last time I used that shower, I got this nasty toe fungus. Wait, what that... is carfentanil? Doris touched the food, and he's showering now, and you could have been exposed to airborne particles. Here's a 2022 episode of NCIS Hawaii. Wait, how many fucking NCIS shows are there? At this point, there's got to be more NCIS episodes than there are NCIS agents or naval officers who have been murdered. How many naval officers are even left in the NCIS universe? <coughs> <coughs> Anyways, here's an episode of NCIS Hawaii where a soldier steps into a tide pool with fentanyl in it and instantly overdoses and dies from contact exposure through abrasions in his feet. Corporal Conahaley died of a fentanyl overdose. Get that from an instant tox screen. Uh, got that from these. They were in the tide pool with him. MCRT ran a test, 100% pure fentanyl. Drugs likely entered his bloodstream through abrasions on his feet. This is, again, and this might be, you might be catching the running theme here, uh, patently ridiculous. Here's a photo of someone dousing their hands in fentanyl with abrasions on their hands and not dying. <laughs> All of this makes sense if you use your brain for like half a second. Why would people go through the trouble of injecting fentanyl into their veins if they could get high just from touching it? If you could overdose from touching fentanyl, why does it seemingly only happen to police officers in news stories and not EMTs responding to overdoses or doctors and nurses who handle these patients later? It seems that as news has spread that contact exposure is bullshit, these shows have had to get incredibly creative at finding ways to make conditions that seem plausible. Later in that same episode of NCIS Hawaii, an agent explains why he has such a personal vendetta against fentanyl. Show up to the scene, what do I find? Two dead bodies. No, oh, four. You know, Hitch and Gomez found the kids on the floor. What does their training tell them? Try life-saving measures. Yeah, gave the kids mouth to mouth, and like that, stopped breathing. Just from the residue on their lips. This story seems to be ripped from a March 11th, 2022 headline, where two young people in Fort Lauderdale attempted CPR on their overdosing friends, and police claimed they were, quote, exposed to the drug. But according to the Journal of Emergency Medicine, the published statements that two of the victims absorbed enough fentanyl to overdose while performing CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation are dubious, and scientifically, extremely unlikely. Additionally, the ABC News affiliate WPLG-10's statement that a hazardous materials team responded to scour the house because any contact with fentanyl could make others sick as well is patently false. So that's a big ol' L for broadcast television. <laughs> On to the next one. How are all these people overdosing? The vast majority of overdose victims in broadcast TV shows are people who do not even know that they're ingesting fentanyl. From those thinking that they're just taking prescription painkillers. Just want to find out who gave Thomas a hot batch of Oxycontin. Percocet, definitely counterfeit. Probably fentanyl. To those receiving a hot shot of heroin. So she was given a hot shot. To ecstasy pills laced with fentanyl. The preliminary report from ME puts all four deaths on ecstasy cut with fentanyl. While fentanyl was created for pain treatment in controlled settings by doctors in the 1960s and and has actually been found in street drugs since at least the 1970s, 
Recently, lethal doses have been appearing in all sorts of other drugs, often without consumers or sometimes even dealers knowing. Data from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention found that in 2021, fentanyl was involved in 74% of heroin deaths, 71% of cocaine deaths, and 54% of meth deaths. According to a Washington Post analysis, quote, yearly cocaine fatalities over the past decade have quintupled, and 90% of that rise can be explained by fentanyl. So these shows are definitely right so far, but you may be asking yourself, why is this deadly drug ending up in so many other drugs? Or as this doctor points out, poisoning your customers can't be good for business. Well, long story short, opioids have been on the rise in general, due in large part to big pharmaceutical companies like Purdue Pharma flooding the market with drugs like Oxycontin. Years ago, they pitched these drugs as addiction free and through intensive lobbying efforts, were able to get them over prescribed to the American population. These Patients are prescribed more pain meds than they could possibly need, and there's plenty of folks out there who will pay top dollar for the surplus. Rich prep school kids like Nigel Lewis and Dylan Gardner. Yeah, that's right. It's called supply and demand. It's what made this country great, right? Eventually, the US government responded, limiting access to opioids like Oxy, and in 2021, dissolved Purdue Pharma in bankruptcy. But weirdly, drying up the supply of these prescription painkillers didn't stop people addicted to them from wanting more. I know. It's crazy. Who could have seen that coming? And in that vacuum, fentanyl, far cheaper to make and far more potent, began to fill the void. From that same Washington Post report, quote, On the streets of US cities in the early 2000s, the most popular prescription pain pill was made by Malincrod Pharmaceuticals, one of the nation's oldest drug manufacturers. The company's 30 milligram oxycodone tablets, known as Blues or M30s, sold for roughly $30 a piece on the black market. Today, fake M30s made by Mexican cartels using fentanyl look identical, but sell for $4 or $5 a piece on the streets of San Diego. That combination of low cost, low volume, and high potency is crucial to understanding the rise of fentanyl. Dealers can use fentanyl and make counterfeit painkillers that are even more powerful than users are expecting or ready for with lethal results. Or they can cut drugs like meth or cocaine with fentanyl, making them orders of magnitude more powerful and addictive while using less of the original drug. From an ABC News report conveniently titled, If fentanyl is so deadly, why do drug dealers use it to lace illicit drugs? Quote, Overdose deaths usually lead to investigation by law enforcement, which is bad for business and can often result in the dealer's arrest. However, the drug is so profitable that it's worth the risk. We know cartels cut their drugs with something cheaper to stretch their supply. It used to be aspirin even baby powder, and now it's fentanyl. 50 times more powerful than heroin. That's exactly right, Queen Latifah. Wait, why is Queen Latifah playing Denzel Washington's role in the TV version of The Equalizer? No shots at Queen Latifah, but she doesn't exactly have the uh, action hero persona that, from that movie's. It's, it'd be like if Danny DeVito starred in the John Wick TV series. Anyway, Latifah is right. Add another to the win column for broadcast cop shows, I guess. I know this is surprising and a little disappointing, to be honest. I mean, we know, we're all here to dunk on these shows, right? You, you know what? Let's get back to, let's get back to, fuck you, Nickus. Who's Nickus? You know, Nickus. Sometimes he goes to Los Angeles. Sometimes he goes to New Orleans. Are you, do you mean NCIS? Mask up for fentanyl? When these shows aren't coming up with creative ways to get fentanyl under people's skin, they opt for something much more cinematic. Airborne fentanyl. Whoa, 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 wait. Okay, that's fentanyl. Okay, if that back rips, we're all dead. Oh no! Who knew that all you needed to do to get high on fentanyl was to breathe near it? I guess your supply can last forever? I. It's, it doesn't make a lot of sense. This is also doubly funny because four seasons earlier in this same show, these same cops did not freak out in remotely the same way when they found fentanyl residue in a suitcase that they had been handling with their hands. They also found residue of pure fentanyl in the bag as well. I'm guessing that's what Michelle was sneaking into Ryan's suitcase for the first few trips before they upgraded to the more potent stuff. If only that had killed them, then we wouldn't be here today. Now, there is some evidence of overdoses from aerosolized fentanyl. In 2002, Russian authorities pumped aerosol suspected to contain car fentanyl into a theater in Moscow during a hostage crisis, killing over 100 people. <laughs> That'll show those hostages fucking dummies getting captured, am I right? However, this is an extreme example, requiring large amounts of the drug, 
a sealed theater, and what the American Academy of Clinical Toxicology calls an optimized airborne dispersal device unlikely to be encountered in a local event. As it turns out, fentanyl isn't particularly volatile. It doesn't readily vaporize or get into the air undisturbed. From Dr. Marino again, Fentanyl also has a very low vapor pressure, which is a physics concept that relates to its ability to aerosolize. Fentanyl does not aerosolize under everyday conditions. It does not under most conditions found on Earth. People can snort it, but this is intentional. It does not just get into the air. To cause toxicity from breathing it in, you would probably have to be in a wind tunnel with dunes of fentanyl around you. Or a bag could rip and you could be caught in a little dust cloud of instant death. Checkmate, science. And this is not the only time a menacing cloud of fentanyl threatens to kill our police heroes. It takes large amounts of fentanyl to get into the mucous membrane of your nose in order to ingest fentanyl. You have to literally snort it. And even if you were to be exposed in this way, it would not instantly incapacitate you. According to the Orlando Recovery Center, taking a dose of fentanyl through a tablet, lozenge, or nasal spray will usually take about 15 to 30 minutes to take effect. This is not chloroform. These are patently ridiculous portrayals of fentanyl overdose, another big ol' L for broadcast TV. Although it's hard for me to completely blame these shows because there's been a lot of misinformation out there. So if you touch this stuff, it could kill you. Yeah. Just touch it. There's a reason we have a medic standing by, Scott. And that's because uh, an overdose is unfortunately, it's something that we have to be prepared for, even, even dealing with it in an evidence bag. A study published by the National Library of Medicine in 2020 found that misinformed media reports received approximately 450,000 Facebook shares, potentially reaching nearly 70 million users from 2015 to 2019. Amplified by erroneous government statements, misinformation received excess social media visibility by a factor of 15 compared to corrective content, which garnered fewer than 30,000 shares with potential reach of 4.6 million Facebook users. This is doubly hard to combat when some of that misinformation is coming from the fucking DEA and CDC themselves. In 2016, a now deleted DEA communique claimed that a small amount of fentanyl ingested or absorbed through the skin can kill you. And the agency shared a video featuring two New Jersey officers who claimed to have overdosed from inhaling airborne fentanyl. Of course, the symptoms they described were loss of blood flow to the face, disorientation, and shortness of breath, consistent with uh, panic attacks, not opioid overdose. Regardless, the video appeared in at least 80 articles found in that 2020 study I referenced earlier. And it's not just the cops over at the DEA. Up until July 2022, the CDC featured a video on its website that showed three officers claiming to experience overdose symptoms after being in the presence of suspected fentanyl. This is a lot of words doing a lot of work in that sentence. These myths have been debunked for years, and yet they continue to spread through news reports, TV shows, and even government agencies. Okay, last but certainly not least, who's overdosing? By and large, these shows depict overdose victims as young, often teenagers. This one of the fentanyl overdoses? So young. Yeah, 13. I understand you had four fatalities last night. All under the age of 20. With OD at a prep school in the past six weeks. Can't be more than 15, 16, naked, no ID. You have robbed this world of a precious boy. Out of the 15 episodes with identifiable overdose victims, over half, eight, focused on victims who were 20 years old or younger. And that's just 
not entirely accurate. According to data from the CDC, in 2021, just 5,936 out of 70,601 fentanyl-related overdose deaths occurred in people aged 15 to 24, accounting for roughly 8% of deaths. Now that's not to diminish the tragedy of those deaths. And according to the Washington Post, fentanyl was the leading cause of death for Americans aged 18 to 49 in 2021. But I do think that there is a kind of outsized focus on teenagers, which at some level is understandable. There's nothing like a young white girl dying to drum up feelings of tragedy in an audience. Taylor was 17. She had her whole life ahead of her. And while the age of overdose victims skews much younger than reality, the raw numbers in terms of ethnicity and gender do break down pretty accurately with the raw data. About half the episodes focused on white overdose victims and roughly a third on female victims, which checks out. I could quibble about how the rates of overdose are way more extreme amongst black and native populations, but you know, it's America. What else is new? I think what's much more striking is the economic status of those overdose victims. Nearly all in these shows are rich, some incredibly so. In this FBI International episode from 2022, our overdose victim is the son of the seventh richest person in the world. Gabriel Watts, founder of Force Innovation, seventh richest person in the world with a net worth of $62.5 billion. Imagine having to live up to all that. Man, poor kid. Seventh richest guy in the world is your dad? It's really a handicap when you think about it. This kind of affluent victim is all over these shows. Here's a Blue Bloods episode where fentanyl is going around a prep school. You seem like a pretty smart kid, Nigel. Trust me. I know a lot of smart kids who end up in prison for drugs. She's right. My mom's a criminal defense attorney. If you're gonna arrest me without probable cause, she'll be waiting at the precinct. You might be recognizing the pattern here. These are young people overdosing completely by accident who have their whole futures ahead of them. It's very sympathetic, and it sends a pretty clear message. These could be your kids next. This fentanyl's different. I mean, people don't think it's dangerous because it's prescription, but this street stuff. It's insidious. Yeah, and dealers mix it with other drugs. So some kid could be at a party, take a hit from a joint, and die in an instant. Some kid? Our kids. Just for the record, there's absolutely no evidence of fentanyl being found in marijuana. Even though police in a number of communities have raised alarm bells about them, this has been thoroughly debunked. And with all these police claims, there's conveniently never any kind of toxicology screen evidence, just the police saying they suspect fentanyl and that getting put out into the universe. And even if there was fentanyl and marijuana, you know what would be an easy way around that? Legalize and regulate it. Problem solved. If my dispensary was lacing marijuana with fentanyl, it would not take the police long to track my overdose to that dispensary. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with picking overdose victims who the audience will be sympathetic to. And in general, I find the portrayals of fentanyl overdoses to be much more forgiving and sympathetic in these shows than previous iterations of street drugs. It's just a slip, not a leap. And we used to just buy them a drink. Yeah, but they didn't die from it. Kids are supposed to learn from their mistakes, not die from them. That's good. I like, I like that. I mean, I don't like that he died, but he's fictional, so whatever. But there is something to be said about the overdose victims that this approach erases. Only one overdose victim out of the roughly 35 I noted in these episodes was someone who could be classified as a regular user or addict. An army vet named Juan who's personal friends with an agent in the show FBI. I gave him $2,000. He was playing you, Omar. He's an addict. While fentanyl is certainly killing people who are not regular drug users, this approach to portraying it minimizes a huge portion of people affected by the fentanyl flooding the drug market. According to the CDC, one in seven Americans reports experiencing a substance use disorder. In the same survey, 1.6 million Americans reported suffering specifically from opioid addiction. And those are the self-reported numbers. In 2020, the Department of Health and Human Services estimated that more than 9 million Americans misused opioids. Yet, in all the episodes I watched, only four characters struggled with addiction. Juan, who I mentioned earlier, a teacher in Blue Bloods, and two other characters from that same episode of FBI who were both in recovery. Well, it can be pretty hard to spot unless you've lived with the disease yourself. Instead, these shows tend to go out of their way to assure us that whoever died was not an addict, and thus is worthy of our sympathy. So cause of death? 
OD, China White, highly concentrated fentanyl. This girl wasn't an addict. There's no trace in her hair and nails, no needle marks. Any history of drug use? Not that I know of. She was a good kid. In the same vein, the only time I saw a homeless person mentioned in one of these shows was in Chicago PD, where the homeless person was accidentally killed in a crossfire. We got another one, homeless guy caught in a crossfire. That's it, that's the only time homelessness is even mentioned. While homelessness is something that is rarely addressed in any TV show, when it comes to fentanyl, this kind of oversight is kind of bananas to me. In 2022 in Seattle, where I live, 310 homeless people died on the streets. And in over half of those, 160, fentanyl was involved. This epidemic isn't something just killing rich kids, it's been exceptionally deadly to impoverished and marginalized communities. I'm gonna count this as another L for broadcast TV, because of how it limits the scope of the crisis. Okay, so broadcast TV shows are inaccurate. Who cares? TV isn't real life, Skip. Don't, don't you know that? Okay, first of all, for some of us, TV is life. But more importantly, I think that when these shows rip their stories from the headlines and tie themselves to real police agencies, they adopt an unmistakable tone of authenticity and realism. These shows aren't called the fictional police of Metropolis. They're called things like Chicago PD, FBI, SWAT, and East New York. These take place in real places and insert real things like fentanyl to double down on that perception of legitimacy. And it's not just that these shows get facts about fentanyl wrong, it's the way they get it wrong that really matters. So far, we've really only fact-checked these broadcast TV shows. We haven't gone into a lot of detail about their plot lines or anything really outside of the parts where they specifically say fentanyl. And th there's a good reason for that. These shows are, are bad. They're really bad. Like, just really lazy and weird. And uh, there's so much stuff worth pointing out that's just not good. You know what? Let's do this. Let's have a montage of some of my favorite terrible moments with no context whatsoever. What do we got, officers? Narcotic odor. That's three kills, people. Puts them in the Murderer Hall of Fame. It's like we've reverted back to some ancient form of hieroglyphics. Well, our forensics team did a geometric reconstruction of your eye line, and based on their analysis, they believe there's a 97.94% chance that you were looking right at Ryan. Has our guy been reported missing? No, nothing on the dark web. But I did learn how to say virgin auction in Vietnamese. I'm 98.6% sure the fentanyl was dumped about a quarter mile off the Kailua coast. 98.6% sure? I'm actually 100% sure. Yeah, I don't think no pretty white girl could handle uncut. Huh, I'd actually pay more for uncut. Even if it means me taking a chubby, I will suck it up. Nothing wrong with that. <sighs> Man, that, that felt good. And uh, believe me, context does not help those scenes very much. Anyway, back to the point I was uh, supposed to be making. One thing that permeates these shows is a general conservative, or rather, anti-liberal tone. Characters often take random pot shots at liberal cities. Since when do you hate LA? Since forever, come on, it's got no flavor. People are all... Superficial? Yeah, they all want to be actors or surfers, they eat sushi all day, they hate art. Berlin's supposed to be a mecca for young artists, but it's unaffordable unless you get accepted into a fancy residency or you have rich parents. Or talent. There's a lot of racial coding when it comes to talking about drug dealers. And don't go messing around with this stuff. That's pure fat right there. The one whiff and you're muerto, man. You know what real music is? Yes, I do. It's a form of hip hop that references violence and criminal behavior. Sam. I said, I know what it is. And over on Blue Bloods, Commissioner Fashstash is doing some kind of weird version of small governmentism. This isn't about God, Terry. It is about a very old and powerful institution that is run by men. And in my experience, anything that fits that description usually has an agenda. Except, except the police, right? Just an incredible lack of self-awareness. God, Blue Bloods is just the fucking worst. And in the same vein, these shows love to plop in irrelevant little factoids about the origins of fentanyl. But how did he get it? They smuggled it in from China and cut it in abandoned buildings. China is a major supplier. Either as a distribution hub, ferrying narcotics from China where they're made to the mainland. Have you ever heard of China White? Yeah. 
That's a street term for fentanyl. That's what he was selling when I busted it. Now, it is true that the DEA estimates that most synthetic opioids are produced abroad and then imported to the United States. And it is true that the first wave of fentanyl and the chemicals used to synthesize it came from China. And these shows are accurate that most fentanyl entering the country today originates from Mexican cartels. The stuff you're selling is not from some knockoff pill facility in Mexico. Because we're going after a Mexican drug cartel which in all likelihood is responsible for bringing the fentanyl into the United States and supplying the Santiago's. Occasionally, this is relevant information, like in the East New York episode where she stumbles upon an undercover operation to go after a Mexican cartel. But in the vast majority of these instances in which it's mentioned on these TV shows, the origin of fentanyl is not relevant to the plot of the episode whatsoever. It's just something that these shows are trying to remind their audiences of for some reason. Either inhaled it or even just touched it, but it's 100 times stronger than heroin. And that could explain why the Narcan's moving so slow. But how did he get it? They smuggled it in from China and cut it in abandoned buildings. Now, none of these individual little details say much on their own, but when you add them up, the constant whining about how foreign fentanyl is, the focus on how it could be your kids who overdose, and these conservative little virtue signals, a pattern starts to become clear that is uh, eerily familiar to the war on drugs. Several of these shows have gone so far as to advocate taking the law into your own hands in regards to punishing those responsible for the fentanyl epidemic. All right, I'm a cop. I swore an oath, an oath to uphold the law. If this was the man who killed your son, if he was responsible for what happened to you and him, I would answer to a different oath, a higher oath. You know what he stole from me? If she was gonna go to law school, now I'll never get to see her graduate. I never get to walk her down the aisle. See her become a parent herself. He stole all that from me, from her. Ironically, the only show to even gesture at Big Pharma's role in creating the opioid crisis in the first place is... Blue Bloods? Wait, did, did I read that right? Your patients are selling their extra pain meds to drug dealers. That's unfortunate. Shouldn't you take this up with them? Well, we wouldn't have to take it up with them if docs like you weren't throwing these drugs around like candy on Halloween. Putting so much of this junk out on the streets, you know better than the drug dealers themselves. Something double weird about that episode is that it also includes basically the only example among these cop shows that portrays someone legitimately suggesting rehab. You complete rehab, and I mean go in there and get clean. Should be willing to knock the possession charge down to a violation, which means you could walk away from this whole thing without a record. Someone clearly put something in the water at the Blue Bloods office that week. Instead, in the aggregate, these shows create a narrative of fentanyl as basically anthrax being sent over the border by foreigners who are trying to kill your kids. And well, you know, I can see why that might scare the shit out of people. Now, this fear does a couple of important things. First and foremost, fear can only hurt those who are overdosing. I mentioned earlier Narcan, a nasal spray version of the drug naloxone that rapidly reverses opioid overdoses. To spare you the scientific mumbo jumbo that even I don't really understand, it basically blocks the opioid receptors in the brain. What does naloxone, at least in its Narcan form, look like? How does it work? What they did is they put naloxone inside this essentially like a nasal spray type contraption. The person is passed out. You put it up the person's nose. You hit the spray function and you've delivered the dose. That's how it works. Within two to eight minutes, the person will come out of it. It's an incredible drug. And earlier this year, the FDA approved the medication for over-the-counter use, meaning that it will be much more readily available just in case. Narcan can save lives, fast, but not if people think that getting close to fentanyl is going to kill them. If you've seen these myths that fentanyl can kill you through incidental contact or through airborne particles, you're going to be less likely to help someone who is overdosing, and that might cost that person their life. Second, this rampant amount of misinformation can cause lawmakers to chase bad solutions in response to public outrage. Despite the fact that fentanyl enters the United States through legal ports of entry, and that the vast majority of people sentenced for fentanyl trafficking are U.S. citizens, focusing energy on the foreign nature of fentanyl lead to things like Trump's $11 billion border wall. You kill one person, you get the death penalty in many states. Or you get life imprisonment. You kill 5,000 people with drugs because you're smuggling them in and you're making a lot of money and people are dying 
And they don't even put you in jail. They don't do anything. And this isn't just an orange man bad thing either. President Joe Biden has continued an emergency order that makes it easier to prosecute people for selling fentanyl analogs, immediately classifying them as Schedule 1 drugs without the usual multi-step scientific oversight, and triggering onerous mandatory minimum sentences in the process. As Politico summarizes, quote, Instead of opposing the stricter enforcement, Biden favors making the order permanent, a move civil rights groups, public health researchers, criminal justice reform experts, and other critics argue would further embolden federal law enforcement authorities and disproportionately affect low-income defendants of color. Opponents say it would usher in a remarkable change in drug law, one that criminalizes thousands of substances, some that haven't even yet been developed, and set a precedent that could eventually extend to other drug categories. This kind of outsized fear is also really useful to police agendas. The more dangerous the public believes the job of a police officer is, that they could tie from fentanyl at any point, the more voters are likely to support bigger budgets and more resources. And again, this isn't just something being spread by narrative TV shows. Real-life police officers have consistently made claims about overdoses from breathing or touching fentanyl. Although, again, they never followed up with any kind of toxicology report or something that would actually confirm that they had overdosed. Huh. Weird how that happens. Here's an officer who claims to have overdosed from incidental contact being pressed on the idea by a harm reduction activist on TikTok. My point still stands. Like, if this if this is true and somehow you've passively OD'd on Fint, then this okay. would completely change everything. So it would be your responsibility to provide toxicologist reports and everything that, that could, you know, validate your story. The DEA is exceptionally unhinged in regards to pushing this fear. You may remember Remember the rainbow fentanyl scare from 2022. Pills looking like candy sold on our streets. Agents say the new way drug dealers are trying to market fentanyl is mixing it with other colors to attract users. The DEA and law enforcement have seized rainbow fentanyl pills across 18 states. And while it hasn't reached Pennsylvania just yet, a mom from New Jersey whose son died of an overdose says parents of young children need to pay attention. In August 2022, the DEA issued a press release where the head of the DEA and Milgram said, quote, Rainbow fentanyl, fentanyl pills and powder that come in a variety of bright colors, shapes, and sizes is a deliberate effort by drug traffickers to drive addiction amongst kids and young adults. Why do you think they're doing that? So we believe that they're doing this to get new users, to appeal to younger users, we're finding it all over the social media platforms. It looks like candy. Milgram would go on to make the completely batshit claim that, quote, our kids are on smartphones and that means that the cartels are following them. No, Anne, I think you're thinking of Google or Facebook. The DEA would continue to pump out this storyline until Halloween of that year, driving a number of stories aimed at scaring, I mean warning, parents about the upcoming trick-or-treat season. But what is new, according to the Drug Enforcement Agency, rainbow fentanyl pills packaged in bright colors marketed for your kids. We consider the DEA to be a marketing strategy by traffickers to create addiction in children and uh, young adults. Parents need to hear with Halloween coming up. It's about potentially deadly fentanyl pills that look like candy. Drug officials in New York confiscated 15,000 of the rainbow colored pills and the many of them were hidden in a Lego box. And then weirdly, it just stopped being an issue afterwards. Weird. If you Google rainbow fentanyl news stories, they'll all be from that two month span. There have been a few seizures of colorful fentanyl since then, but as an issue that needed to be addressed publicly by the head of the DEA, it has completely disappeared. And that's because it was always bullshit. As Maya Dosimkins, founder of the Opioid Safety and Naloxone Network told CNN, quote, the reason it's colored is just to differentiate products. If we had a regulated market, they would be differentiated in different ways. We do not. It has nothing to do with marketing to kids at all, period, whatsoever. The fear the DEA is pushing is also useful because it distracts from just how much the DEA sucks. In 2015, the head of the DEA retired after revelations that agents were attending sex parties with prostitutes hired by Colombian drug cartels. In 2018, Agent Fernando Gomez was charged with participating in a decade-long conspiracy to smuggle thousands of pounds of cocaine from Puerto Rico to New York. In 2020, Agent Jose Irizarry was accused of conspiring to launder money for a Colombian drug cartel while living a lavish 
lavish lifestyle replete with wild yacht parties, bikini-clad prostitutes, and homes in Colombia, Puerto Rico, and South Florida. And need I remind you that even earlier, back in 2010, it was revealed that Agent Hank Schrader was unable to topple the largest methamphetamine empire in the Southwest despite the head cook being his brother-in-law. <laughs> Don't worry though, it's not just the DEA. Earlier this year, Joanne Segovia, the head of the San Jose Police Officers Union, was charged with trafficking after receiving 61 shipments of fentanyl to her home. You, you want to know how law enforcement was originally able to draw a link between the Mexican cartels and fentanyl? It's because they tailed a former Border Patrol agent named Cesar DeLeo, who was importing fentanyl precursor chemicals and then transporting them over the border to cartels. So do conservatives want us to back the blue or, or death penalty for drug dealers? I can never remember. One of the most disgusting ways this fear manifests in political discourse is the way it taints conversations about homelessness in America. Conservatives just love to say that it's not a housing problem, it's a drug problem. It's not a homeless problem out here. You have people using these tents to essentially sell drugs and to traffic people. So, so in San Francisco, it makes sense. In fact, it pays to get high on the sidewalk. Don't bother to get an education. Nobody cares. So JJ, when you talk to these people, what do they tell you? They tell me they just want to get high. Even liberals love this argument. Here's an article from the Seattle Times asking, should we stop talking about the homeless crisis and start calling it the fentanyl crisis? As we discussed earlier, fentanyl has proven exceptionally deadly to homeless populations. But apparently, it's not enough to scare people into avoiding them for fear of an accidental overdose. We have to also blame them for this fentanyl crisis. Many conservatives, including one orange presidential candidate, claim that homeless people don't even want housing. They just love drugs so much. We'll ban urban camping wherever possible. Violators of these bans will be arrested, but they will be given the option to accept treatment and services if they're willing to be rehabilitated. Many of them don't want that. Uh, this is, of course, bullshit. Sticking with Seattle, one of their biggest local news broadcasts, Como News, and also a subsidiary of the infamous right-wing Sinclair Broadcasting Group, claims that a survey shows that drug abuse was more of a significant factor than any housing reason, as a way of hand-waving obstacles to housing like affordability, eviction, and foreclosure. Yet when I looked up the exact study that they cite, I noticed that it also said about 94% of all individuals experiencing homelessness reported that they would move inside safe, affordable housing if it was available. Weird how they just didn't mention that part. The attempt to focus on fentanyl instead of housing is kind of ridiculously evil if you think about it. If this is a drug issue, should we just not let these people have shelter? Is the argument that it's better for people to die on the streets than to die in housing? What, what are we talking about here? You see, it's vitally important for conservatives to paint homelessness as a symptom of individual shortcoming rather than the necessary result of a capitalistic housing market. In a housing market, there will always be people who don't get houses. That's how a market works. Scarcity is fundamental to the idea of supply and demand. This is the system we have designed, where housing is not guaranteed, but rather a commodity to be hoarded and traded. And it's seemingly the only way to establish any kind of financial security. But that's an uncomfortable truth about the economics of something that is essential to human life. People don't like hearing that. So the conservative offers other easy scapegoats like drug addiction or mental health, and then channels that energy into escalating disdain. And I really worry that what Housing First has done is taken a lot of, of people who are very much struggling and very much deserving of our compassion, though I think how we, how we provide that compassion is up for debate, uh, but it also introduces you know, people with serious drug problems, serious with mental, serious mental illness problems into communities with kids. So the city's priorities could not be clearer than that. You lavish money on the least productive, most antisocial parasites in our society, and then you punish Americans who work for a living. We don't have enough police to keep our city safe. They're allowing undocumented immigrants to come into the city and sell drugs. And that's why we're hauling your tent to a landfill and cutting off your checks today. You are a drug addict. Get a job or leave. This is our city. You are not allowed to wreck it. You didn't build it. What they really want is to remove these people from view, to make them and their problems invisible. This probably explains why when Bruce Harrell became mayor in Seattle in 2022, his strategy for dealing with homelessness has been to remove homeless encampments at a rapid pace through police sweeps. 
All while we know that the homeless are a diverse population tied by only one common trait. The one thing that all people experiencing homelessness have in common is lack of access to a decent, stable, affordable home. And the research and the evidence are very clear that if people have substance abuse challenges or mental illness, they are best able to address those challenges from a stable home. So low barrier housing first approaches that get people into affordable, stable homes and then provide them with voluntary um, supportive services as necessary is shown again and again in the research and the evidence to be the most effective way to address homelessness. Now, I'm not saying that these broadcast TV shows are nearly as heartless as a place like Fox News, but these shows do set the table for them by amping up fear that these ghouls can then prey upon in a way that directly plays into news reports like this. Tonight, after Fire Country, drug danger. You may be receiving something that you think is as innocent as uh, Advil and is laced with a fentanyl. Inside the DEA's fight to stop a growing problem. If you put a fake pill next to a real one, they can't tell the difference. And the warnings that could save your life tonight after Fire Country. Uh, no, there's no chance you would ever take fentanyl when you thought you were taking Advil unless you bought it off the street. Do, do people buy ibuprofen off the street? This fear is then laundered into xenophobia, PR wins for the police, and a crackdown on homeless people. Look, fentanyl is a real problem, but this kind of misinformation only serves to obstruct real policies that could save lives. Harm reduction efforts like over-the-counter Narcan, safe injection sites, and helping people off the streets. The more these shows play up fear, the more we're going to be stuck dealing with this issue with police action that calls for punishment rather than preventing death and even rolling back the addiction crisis affecting so many of us. I'll leave you with this line from the bipartisan congressional report on fentanyl precursors from 2022. Failure to intervene in ways that appropriately reduce demand and decrease the risk of fatal overdose will almost certainly result in the deaths of hundreds of thousands more Americans. Now, this is not to say that all fear is bad. Sometimes it's very useful, like when you're crossing the street or when I'm trying to sell you something. While these cop shows are focused on criminalizing the poor, a way more pernicious crime has been on the rise. According to the Identity Theft Resource Center, in 2022, data breaches left over 400 million people vulnerable to identity theft and other malicious activities. The best way to protect yourself is by using strong, unique passwords for every account, but it's nearly impossible to keep track of them all without a password manager like NordPass. NordPass uses state-of-the-art encryption to keep your passwords safe and secure, so you can have peace of mind knowing your data is protected. NordPass makes it easy to generate strong, unique passwords for all your accounts so you don't have to worry about hackers getting access to your sensitive information. Plus, it can find out if your online account or credit card information has been leaked, identify where and when the leak happened, and what type of data was compromised. It's a simple, easy to use, and very secure password manager created by the cybersecurity experts who built NordVPN. And with features like autofill and password sharing, you'll save time and hassle on a daily basis. Get exclusive access to NordPass's best offer by going to nordpass.com slash skip intro NordPass, or use code skip intro NordPass at the checkout to get an additional month for free. And if you're still watching, thank you so much for watching. Please share, like, subscribe, do the YouTube stuff, you know, watch another video, that helps. Uh, you can support me on Patreon and become one of these pretty people scrolling by. Ooh, they're so sexy. Over on Patreon, I got stuff like mailbags, monthly TV roundups, and also access to a secondary channel called Lil Skippies, where I do uh, weekly videos just for patrons. Um, maybe that'll be public at some point, but until it is, you could get access to it right now on Patreon. It's pretty cool. I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody watches this to the end. I think I'm probably just wasting, wasting air. Go Mariners.